spirit of liberty and turn from guilt and dull despair and offer all that faith can do with love to this making all things new. For the congregation, please stand for a call today. Come, out of the darkness of doubt. Open your hearts to receive God's healing love.
Thy wonders wrought already require no ceaseless praises, but show thy power and my rage war, endure with heavenly graces, but fill our earth with glory, and known by every nation, God of all grace, receive thy praise of all thy new creation. Father God, we come this morning on this the 23rd day of April 2023. And we pause to say thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity of seeing and experience another day of your wonderful creation. All praise and thanks are given to you. And as we go through this worship service, we ask you speak to our hearts, mind, and soul, and forgive us for any sinful act or deed we might have committed. We ask, O oh Father, to create in us a clean heart and renew our right spirit. Speak, Lord, to the one who will proclaim your word. And we ask all these in the precious name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. sends the rain and he sends the sun. 
descends the wind. Whatever pleases him, he does. But this morning we would like to just talk about how concerned some parents or most parents are about their children. Children, we do things willy-nilly. Sometimes we do not remember that our parents are concerned about what we do or where we go. But parents are very concerned. They may be cross with you sometimes and they may discipline you, but that's because of love. Here is a father in the Bible that wanted help and wanted help from Jesus. And when Jesus does anything, anywhere, he does it in a crowd or he does it in one and one and people spread the word. It's as if it's in this time he said, if you hear something, say something. If you see something, say something. Do not keep it to yourself. Now Jesus was in Cana of Galilee where he turned water into wine. And here was a father who was not, he was not there, but he heard about the good deeds of Jesus. And he had one special thing for Jesus to do for him. And I'm going to, uh, let's hope your children have read this book through already. Yes? Who read it through already? Who read some of it already? Raise your hand high. Thank you, sir. Some people keep it at home as if it to gather dust. But I am going to implore you to read it. Jesus returned to the town of Cana, where he had changed water into wine. A rich man heard that Jesus had come. The rich man was from the city of Capernaum, more than 10 miles away. But the man traveled all the way to Cana because he had something important to say to Jesus. He wanted Jesus to make his son well. The son was very sick. Please come quickly before my child dies, the rich man said. But Jesus told the man, go home. Because your son is already well again. He will not die. He will live. The man believed Jesus. So he started back home. But before he got there, his servants met him. They said, your son is well. He asked them, what time did the child had started to get better? They said, yesterday at about one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. The man knew that this was the same time Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So the rich man and all his family believed in Jesus as the son of God. I tell you this story this morning because last week there were some parents who were very concerned about their son. And their son was shot. The parents sent the son to go and pick up the younger sibling. And he went to the wrong street and the wrong house. And knocked on the door. He did not try to break in. He knocked on the door. And the owner of the house shot him through the door because he looked big, he said. So the parents were very concerned when he did not come home and when they heard he was in the hospital. The parents were very concerned about their son. The other children that he went to school with him and all the other parents, they were all concerned about this child. 
who is just 15 years old. So children, we all make mistakes. Adults make mistakes. You make mistakes. So you pray and your parents pray to God to keep you safe everywhere you go. To cover you everywhere that you go. They are very concerned about you. So even if your parents discipline you, they love you. They are concerned about what happens to you. And not only your own parents, but when we were growing up, everybody on the street loves our parents because they all look after us. They all cons are concerned about our, our, our whereabouts and what happens to us. So let us pray to God, asking God to cover you wherever you go. This man from Capernaum, he was away from his son. But Jesus took care of him, although they are far apart. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for keeping our children safe. Thank you for covering them wherever they go. We thank you, O oh God, that even when they make mistakes, that their mistakes cannot cause them fatality. We pray, O oh God, that you will just bless them all and bless all parents this day. Parents who are mourning for their children. We pray, O oh God, that you will just bless us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you. With words from my mouth, I love you. I need you to survive. It is as well that
I invite you now to stand for the reading of the gospel lesson. And this is to be found in St. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 13 through to verse 35. Verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? 
He asked them, what things? They said, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since Jesus, since, sorry, since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village, to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven there and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here ends the reading of the Gospel as the side of the We will now be blessed with the ministry of music from Sister Tyler.
He was about bringing pieces together in a way that would make people whole again. This was what Jesus was about. You are dead, he raised you to life. Lazarus knew that. The son of the widow at Nain knew that from experience. We know that the, the, the man who was blind, Bartimaeus, he knew that, right? Because Jesus restored his sight. We knew that, we know that the woman who was caught in adultery knew what restoration was because Jesus restored her. So whatever Jesus did was a dramatization of the gospel. One would have thought that the disciples would remember what Jesus said to them, especially those very important promises that he made, because he told them that he was going to die and he was going to be raised to life on the third day. They should have remembered that. They should have remembered the day he died. That three days afterwards he was going to be raised to life. We know that the women who went to the tomb that Easter morning, they not only witnessed an empty tomb, but they, through Mary at least, had an encounter with Jesus, the risen Lord. We know that Jesus showed up that evening in that room where the doors were closed. We know that, right? And we know he showed up a second time the next week because who was the present? Thomas was the present. And he challenged Thomas to faith in him, to believe what he had said to them over those three years. In our text, we have two others who were in their midst. We don't normally call them disciples or apostles. In fact, we don't connect the name Cleopas with any of the twelve. But obviously, they were persons, these two were persons who were part of the group, who followed Jesus, who listened to him, who hung on to every word that he spoke. But they now were in Jerusalem. They might have been there from Friday, so they knew he died. Especially because of the way in which they dressed Jesus. But not only did they witness his death, they now heard what the woman had said. They, however, might have had pressing work back home, but a ruler. So they decided they stay the night in Jerusalem. They headed off home to Emmaus. And on this journey, I want you to pay attention to some things that happened along this journey. Because they were walking along and they were talking with each other about what had happened that weekend. And while they were doing that, while they were rehearsing the events of the weekend, this stranger, that's how they spoke about it, this stranger came up on them and inquired of them what they were talking about. Notice what they did. They stopped. And they look at him with sadness. Was it simply because they were sad in their own heart? Or were they sad that this stranger didn't even know what had taken place in Jerusalem? So then they now set about telling this stranger what had happened. In the midst of this sharing, this stranger decided to reel them in. He decided to interrupt their hopelessness, their despair. He decided to speak truth to the power of evil and darkness that had held them captive. Because if you listen to the way in which they talked about this, they didn't really believe what they had heard. 
the women they came and told us that he was raised. So this stranger challenged them. Challenged them in a way that they should have known. That's what basically was saying. How foolish can you be? You should have known what took place, what's supposed to happen. And then it says that Jesus, this stranger, began to unpack for them the gospel message from Moses in the Old Testament to the present. You see, it's one thing to talk the talk, but it's another thing to walk the walk. You see, it's one thing to say, to spout what we might have been taught as children, but it's another thing to actually live the consequences of what we speak. It is one of those things that I um, just can't fathom with this movement that we are in in these times, where the whole argument around homosexuality and the fighting for rights and, 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 and in a sense, pushing against the, the book of discipline in our church. And it says that if you do certain things, you should be tried, Sister Comfort. A trial should happen. But you know the difference here? They want to do the talk, but not the walk. There are consequences when you begin to do the walk. And so they want to have their cake and eat it. So on the one hand, they want to speak these things, but they don't want the consequences of their speech. They want to do things and get away with it. There is a sacrifice that persons should be willing to pay if they are willing to do the walk. But there are persons who want to do the talk by the man, but not do the walk. So here was Jesus on this path to Emmaus, meeting up with these two disciples. And notice some things that Jesus really revealed in our text. The first thing is that Jesus was pushing them to experience being witnesses from within. Hmm? You're with me, Sister Vicky? Witnesses from within, it's not enough to just witness the death. You should also understand the implications of the death. These folk did not understand that. They just thought he had died. These women came with fanciful stories that he's alive. We don't even take that seriously. So they're setting off. Understand to, to be a witness is to put one's life on the line. Hmm? You can't be a witness and just keep it to yourself. Not here. To be a witness is to put one's life on the line for what one believes. So there are consequences to, to believing certain things and to speak certain things. But it goes beyond that. It should bring about a change on your insight. In other words, that if you believe something, you should act differently. There should be a transformation that reflects one's beliefs. So when we look at our text, the, we see that these disciples were witnesses. Eyesight witnesses. But the change had not been effected on the inside. I know some of us, you know, we grew up in the church, and so we come to that place in our lives where we figure that we have outgrown the church. And we get busy doing other things and trust that we live long enough to come back to church in our old age. We know that, we don't know whether or not we're going to live that long. Hmm? 
But the, 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 the heart of this though is that at that point they will say that I've always been a member, always been a believer. And when push comes to shove, they will step away again because the witness had not made any change on the inside. Too many of us have gone through life hearing and saying that we believe certain things, but our actions are out of sync with what we say we believe. That was a part of what Jesus was doing to these disciples. He was saying to them, yes, you might have seen, but if you really believed, it would have cut your heart. Change would have happened. You would have been behaving differently. In fact, you would have stayed around long enough in Jerusalem or stayed around long enough in Galilee where you would have encountered Jesus. Hmm? Now think about it. The women came and they said, Jesus, we met Jesus, we saw him. And he says he, he is going ahead of you to, to Galilee and there you will see him. They left town. Wonder what would have happened if they had actually stayed in town and gone to Galilee. The kind of encounter that they would have had, showing them his hands and asking them to put their hand in his side and be no longer unbelieving but faithful. You know, some of us will speak the speech but not necessarily want to walk the walk. Not necessarily want to make the changes in our lives so that we are different. So that's the W sister Vicky. Witness, yes, but the witness that counts is the witness that takes place from within. So we say it's about the walk, right? So what does the A really stand for? The A for you should mean that the appearance happened, that Jesus does show up. Notice that they were going about their business, they were experiencing what they were experiencing, and it's in the midst of their experiencing their life, brothers and sisters, that Jesus appeared. And I want you to pause, want to pause long enough, brothers and sisters, to remind you that Jesus always shows up in the midst of our lives, ups and downs. No matter what's going down with us, it's in the midst of that, that he appears. These folk could not even bring themselves to understand that. But even though we don't believe it or we are unaffected by it, he does appear. He's one of those who make promises when he says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. We should count upon that, that whenever we go through our dark times, we understand that he's with us. And because he's with us, we have no need to fear. We should have hope because he is with us. He promised. And they should know from their own personal experiences that he keeps promise. He's not a one to make promises and just forget about them as we normally do. Because we, you know we do this on, on the first of the year, right? Yeah. When we make all of those resolutions and then by the third of the month and third day of the year we forget. Brother Roland. You know, he, here is a God who makes promises and shows up. Hmm? He not only told the disciples that I go ahead of you to Galilee, but he shows up even though the doors were locked. He shows up. So in, understand this. You can really never lock Jesus' house. But he wouldn't force himself on you either. That's why it says in Revelation, Behold, he stands at the door and he knocks. If anyone hears and opens, I will come in. He's still waiting upon us to open our heart. He appears. He shows up. But it's up to us to let him in. Here were these 
his two disciples walking along this pathway to Emmaus. And as they walked along this pathway, Jesus comes alongside them. And for them, this Jesus who showed up was a stranger. Hmm? Something like what happened in the garden with Mary, no? Mary thought he was the gardener. On a certain level, Mary didn't expect Jesus to be up and about either. Because she came to the tomb for a particular reason. To dress the body, that, the dead body. And when she met the tomb open, and nobody there, she ran to tell them. And you know the story, the two disciples ran, Peter and the other one ran to the tomb, and when the one who got there first stood outside, Peter ran in, took up the clothes, put them, basically touched stuff. They had no business touch. But they were convinced that Jesus came there. Did they remember that he said he was going to be raised to life on the third day? No. They went back home. The baby stood there crying and it was because she stayed around long enough why she had that encounter with Jesus. Some of us are too hasty. We don't want to hang around long enough to have this encounter. And sometimes we pray and we get up and forget about our prayers. So we pray for persons who are sick and then the moment we're done praying, we have no memory of it. Because we don't believe what we pray. We are not willing to walk the walk. You see, if you believe that God is a keeper of his promise, then in truth, when you pray, you know that he will hear you. Unless, of course, you have an iniquity in your heart. And you know what he says in Psalms, right? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So for us, we need not only to understand that we are witnesses, I cite witnesses maybe, but the witnessing really takes place on our inside. So when we're going through our tough times, we know that God who promises to be our healer will heal us. He will restore us when we fall short. When we fall flat on our faces, that he will lift us up. But not only are we to be witnesses from within, but we must be also engaging the appearance, the appearing that happens. Because he does show up. I tell you, if you go through your life's history, you will see that your life's history is replete with opportunities or those instances when he did show up. And at times when they didn't even expect him to show up, he did. When you showed up in the doctor's office and the doctor gives you that devastating uh, piece of information or diagnosis that you could fall apart, all of a sudden you found that which was necessary to hold it together. And you say, if this is God's will, if the end is God's will, then so be it. And he pulls you back from the brink. Hmm? When you feel like if you're going to give up, Somehow you find the strength to keep going. He says, Come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Because he's a God who restores, he's a God who relieves. He promises and he delivers. So witness is from within. And you and I must engage his appearing. But not just that, know what he did. He laid down his life for his friends, he says, in the gospel according to John. So the L has to do with laying down, and I want you to really get this straight. It's not just simply take it and throw it apart. Now nah, it's of no consequence. Notice that in our text, the way the laying down happened is that Jesus was willing to unpack 
for these disciples the message. He was making a case for his resurrection and the impact of his resurrection. So he took time to lay out the message, to lay down the implications of this particular case. Because as according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, if he has not been raised, then our faith is in vain. All these years he went to church is of no consequence. Hmm? Understand that to lay out this message was critical for Jesus. He wanted these, and understand he laid out for these disciples, these two. That when he was willing to go on, they said, no, stay with us. Stay with us. You see, the way that Jesus interprets and presents the gospel to us is in a way that quickens us, that enlivens us, that gives us a new lease of our life, that our despair is not the end. I told you time and time again, if you're really paying attention to scripture, you will notice that God never intends for us to be in a state of defeat. He never intends us to stay in that place. Yes, we might have been defeated, but that's just one battle. It's not the whole war. God doesn't intend us to stay in a state of defeat. It's victory that he promises. So every time we come to that place in our lives where we feel as if the, 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 the enemy has the upper hand, we need to remind ourselves of what Jesus did on the cross. Because he put death to death. It no longer has dominion over us. So we fear not death because we know that even if we die, it's a gateway into life. Paul said it, now. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because for Paul, he knew that death was not the end. God doesn't leave us in that place. So yes, Jesus spent time to unpack for these two disciples the, the true meaning, the true meaning of what Moses them spoke about, what the prophets spoke about, what he himself spoke about. And you see it in our text now, where it says that those two disciples said, didn't our hearts burn within us? when he unpacked the script. In other words then, their hearts took on a different kind of experience. Because now it was more than just simply what we said. He helped us to make sense of the, of the crucifixion and yes, of the resurrection because now they understood that what the women said has weight, has consequences. But it's not just that he intended for them to have witness from within and to engage his appearing and to, for him to lay out for them what the gospel message is and the implications of the gospel. The, the K should remind us that he keeps us within his promise. He is the promise keeper. He embodies the promise of God. But he keeps us within the grace of God. You know, the contrast was that the, that the law was until Christ. But grace and truth comes from Jesus. In other words, then it is in the midst of God's grace that we will find life. It's in the midst of God's grace that we'll find rejuvenation, we'll find restoration. It's in the midst of His grace, yes, and His mercy, that we'll find God at His best. Because we deserve death and destruction, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, He gives us life that is eternal. We are undeserving 
but he gives us more grace when the burdens grow greater. You see, he not only keeps promise, but he keeps us in the midst of God's grace. So when we fall down, we get up again. Because we are not perfect. We are on the road to perfection, but we are not perfect. And God knows that, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. When we fall down, he's there to lift us up, to restore us. And so here, my brothers and sisters, is the question for your contemplation. You have spoken for a long time. Now it's time for the walk. And are you willing to walk with Jesus? He is willing to walk with you. But the key here is whether or not you are willing to walk with him, whether or not you are ready to walk with him, whether or not you are determined to walk with him, because apart from him, you can do nothing. In truth, the impossible that you perceive will be impossibility to you if you are not with Jesus. So it's not enough to talk the talk. It's time now to walk the walk. You know, it's, it's always good to listen to persons who have lived long, you know, Sister Vicky. Because when you sit and listen to them and they tell you their life stories, you begin to understand that you could not have gotten where you got without God's enabling grace. Might have thought that you did this in your own strength, but as you listen to those who have lived long, all of a sudden it begins to make sense that those times when you felt like, you know, you don't know how it happened, but it happened. You were headed in to be fired, and somehow the heart of the boss is softened. You look at the person who is seeking to do you in and you smile at them and all of a sudden their lives change, their countenance change, their attitude towards you change. That's not you. It's God. And when you feel as if you know you should keep silent and all of a sudden you get this push that you can't keep silent, you gotta speak, you gotta tell the truth, you gotta do what is required. That's not you. That's God moving you to be his presence, to be his action. And yes, when your body might be falling apart and, and, and the doctors say you ain't have much time, and in the midst of that you cry out, hallelujah. Somehow in the midst of it, it's not you. It's not you, it's God. God acting in your interest. And then the doctor looked at you some years afterwards and in disbelief. Can't believe you're still alive. Because you should have died. But you, doctor, don't have the last word. It's God who has the last word. And when Jesus say yes, yes sir. nobody can say no. Yes, sir. When Jesus shows up for you, nobody can stop that because God is greater than any. You know, the A. It's not just simply about appearing, you know, it's about the Almighty. God who has power to do what He wants to do, when He wants to do it, how He wants to do it. And it's for us to be open to God's movement, to God's action. So yes, brothers and sisters, it's about the walk. It's about the walk. It's about whether or not you're willing to move beyond the talk and to live what you claim you believe. He's waiting for witnesses in you. He's waiting for persons who are willing to be open, open to become influencers. Persons who are open to him would have the wisdom to speak the right word in the right situation, to be the right person in whatever place you find yourself. He's looking for persons like you, like me, who are willing to lay aside our faith 
and to trust him. Because we are willing to live the consequences of our belief. Willing to walk the walk and not just settle for the talk. Marvelous grace of our loving God. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Marvelous infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are lying to see his face, Will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. My prayer is, my brothers and sisters, that you will hear the call of God on your life. And not leave this place today without first saying, yes, Lord, yes, to your service, to your will. Yes, Lord, yes. I yield myself to you. Lord God, we came, we heard. Now give us the courage, O oh God, to walk and to act as you would have us. So that you, O oh God, receive the glory. First, lay claim to our lives. Lay claim to us. So that all we will think or say or do will be conditioned by you. And then wherever we find ourselves, O oh God, we manifest your grace, your mercy, your peace, and your power. So that those who need to receive it, will receive it on account of our witness. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves today and tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Let us, brothers and sisters, just contemplate what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ be a servant of Jesus Christ requires us to stay with him but we can only stay with him if we give ourselves to him so in these next few moments I want you to seriously contemplate what your future is going to look like in the hands of Jesus and I invite you to give yourselves again to him. And if you have never done that, I invite you to do just that for him now. And if you feel like coming to the altar and demonstrate that, you're free to do that. We're here to greet you and to welcome you on God's behalf. Knowing that his welcome is the welcome that matters. Brother Savage, could we just sing that verse? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon, cleanse you with.
Brothers and sisters, I just want to draw certain things to your attention. Um, brothers and sisters, want to thank you for showing up here this morning. You know what's happening tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is the third installment of the discernment process. So the district superintendent is supposed to be showing up here tomorrow. Hopefully, with information that will be substantial enough in our anticipation of this affiliation. So here's what I want to do. Even for just five minutes to just brief you in terms of preparation for tomorrow's meeting. Okay? Yeah. Also, um, next Sunday at 3 p.m., St. Stephen United Methodist Church in Riverdale, where they say Father Hill, will be celebrating its anniversary. And I have been asked to preach at that anniversary service, and it's always good to look out in a congregation and see persons that you know, persons with whom you're familiar, persons you can zoom into, and in the process, experience a special shot in the arm by the mind. So at 3 o'clock on Sunday next, I'll be preaching at St. Stephen and I trust that some of us, if not all of us, will make our trip to St. Stephen in solidarity. No? Okay. Also want to draw your attention to those who are on our prayer list. I see Sister right out today. Not gonna ask you to run down the aisle. Yeah. <laughs> Not gonna ask that, but we're happy to see you out. Yeah. Uh, and you're exercising those things, huh? So we pray that God continue to increase you. Now, Sister Wright also um, sent a card to my church family. So many times your support and genuine concern have been just what I needed to get me through. Thank you for your prayers, phone calls, cards, flowers, or visits at the hospital. Also to the two persons that made sure I was fed. I really appreciate each and every one. I felt the love. Today, from a heart full, I say thank you. Sister Wright. You know that Sister Wright was going through this by herself. You know, Brother Wright was going through it too. <laughs> so his, it went, it went her knee hurt, so was his hurting too. So we thank him for not only his faithfulness, but for his instrumentality in being there to support and to facilitate. So remember the others are now prayerless and we continue to lift them up. In the course of this last week, we have been lifting up some additional persons and so we ask you to continue to lift them up. Um, brothers and sisters, we know that God is able to make breakthroughs where there seem to be difficult times. Yes, Sister Ryan. Desmond Williams. Sir? Good news about Desmond Williams that I text you about. I don't know if there's no Williams. If you want to give a testimony, you have testimony. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers and sisters, um, for the past month, we have been praying for Desmond Williams, which is Francis' brother. And he did six months of treatment for his cancer. Yes, I know you told me, but sometimes it's good to say, I got a testimony. And I hear you. You say, I got a testimony, and I did give the testimony. Already? Already. Thanks. So continue to pray for those on our prayer list. Um, 
Remember those who are of the awards ceremony committee. Remember the meetings. The next one will be on the 2nd of May. But again, brothers and sisters, we are asking each one of us to take at least three tickets and sell those three tickets so that and it's not the end of it now. If you sell those three tickets and you know others who need, come back and ask and we'll give you. The success of this particular uh, ceremony, the award ceremony, is resting on all of us. Already? Yeah. And I understand that the tickets are not going fast. They're going very, very slow. So we need to up the ante on that. Um,
is what is being asked. Um, just make a contribution. If you want to give a contribution of $30, it's all right. <laughs> but just, you know, just, just $2 is what they're asking. Anyway, so bear that in mind. Yes, we have got a journey. This time you remind me that they is senior months. Um, our activity is a baby age. Again, registrations are slow. And um, presenters are asking how many people. So I have applications with me, so please fill them out so that we can have this activity. And also in the month of May, we want to do some faith interviews with the seniors. You don't have to be a senior to participate. So we Interviews are important because they not only for posterity but for ministry. When you have interfacing with the seniors and you learn from seniors, we can share those kinds of stuff with younger folks. And then we have younger folks talking about seniors, we can share that with our seniors for encouragement too. So bear that in mind now. Okay. Yes, Sister Vicky? Great. Okay. Now we are going to close out the worship service. I want to thank everyone who had anything to do with this worship service today. I um, want to thank Mr. Savage. Remember last week he was here? Yeah. Because he decided to allow somebody to run into the car. <laughs> I'm pushing into somebody that's in front of him. But we are happy to know that he won this. Also, I want to thank um, Brother Roland. For his ministry and God, I want to thank Brother Clyde, who played the steel band in the absence of his teacher. I want to thank Sister Tyra for her ministry of, in ministry of music. I want to thank the ushers. I want to thank Brother Cleveland for sanitization of the space. I want to thank Brother Paul for picking up horses and dropping them off. I want to thank Taj for making sure the quality was put together. Reverend Kayweather, Reverend Dawson, Minister Benjamin, Minister Dickens. I want to thank all of you for the part you played in this worship service. Uh, Sister Carly's mom went into the hospital yesterday, and so we need to be calling to encourage her um, in this process. We know that God is able to restore and to restore in ways that we don't even imagine. So we pray for Sister Carolina and her mom. Is there any other thing I need to remember? Huh? Uh, next Sunday? Not next Sunday, the seventh. The seventh is the is the time for that event. Um, the memorial service for Sister Lena's uh, aunt. Yes, Brother Gums is away in Antigua. He left today for Antigua to be a part of her, um, uh, his uncle's funeral. Um, he did bring the post on the street. I think it's going to be on Tuesday. So we need to not only really trust that he has uh, traveling mercies, but that he's kept. While he's there, then return to us safe. I did um, agree that I was going to ask, allow Brother Benjamin to speak to the um, tweets. So, could you do that post haste and quickly?
we pray just about everything. Yes, the great he was praying for um, Sister Wright for England, and you heard the good news. So I'm appealing to all of you to join us on Wednesday morning from 6 a.m. until 8 a.m. Until then, I'm appealing to all of you to please join us in Bible study on Saturdays at Pearl. I think those men I did every Saturday, I say continue to be with us. Thank you. 
Okay. <laughs>